My name is Chris Burns. I uh, have a talk show on Euronews uh, called The Network. Hopefully you've seen it. You can also see it online, euronews.net. And today we have a discussion on the country media overview of Russia, Russia being the highlight of this MIPCOM this year. And I might begin with setting a bit of the stage for this. We're going to have some high-flying CEOs here from some major media companies as well as other experts uh, talking about the Russian media market. And forget for a moment that I'm a journalist, that I've been a journalist for 25 years. Forget about that. Think of me as uh, an investor, perhaps one of you, uh, or someone who's looking for a co-production. And I am a, a dual French-American national, which I am. And I would like to diversify my activities and holdings and go to an emerging market like Russia because I'm tired of getting a low return uh, in Europe and the United States. So what about Russia? 140 million people, more than 140 million people. Uh, the world's largest energy producer. Box office topped a billion dollars last year. 4% GDP growth uh, this year, expected. It is the envy of debt-ridden Europe and the United States. And that is why Coke is investing $3 billion in Russia, even though the World Bank's ease of doing business ranking puts Russia number 123 out of 183. We're talking about risk and opportunity here. We're talking about amazing opportunity, but let's keep in mind the risk, and that's what we're going to be talking about as well. There are automakers investing billions of euros in, in Russia. Even though Transparency International's corruption index puts Russia at 154 out of 178, that's not good. Why are oil companies, even BP that got its fingers burned by Gazprom, still investing billions in Russia? Why? I'll just quote a little bit from one article by Variety magazine. Right now, Russia is the new China, with a surging box office that shows no sign of slowing, a busy production sector, and a proliferation of billionaires. It has become irresistible to global players in the entertainment industry. But like China, piracy, the lack of a transparent film finance infrastructure, red tape, and a dodgy government make Russia a risky place to do business. But it does wrap up with an upbeat that it is really a, a very uh, a place with a lot of opportunity to do business. Uh, what we should do now is present our panelists. Why don't we all come out at the same time? As I promised you, Anton Kudryashov, CEO of CTC Media. It's a leading Russian TV broadcasting company founded by an American entrepreneur in the 90s, in the 80s, sorry. 100 million people viewers. Uh, he has a background in investment banking at Cadiz Ries and is a uh, founding uh, founder of Renaissance Capital, the Moscow-based bank investment bank. Let's uh, move to Margarita Simonian, editor-in-chief of RT Television. She's covered Chechnya, the Beslan school siege, Abkhazia. She's also vice president of the National Association of TV and Radio Broadcasters. RT is Russia's first English language news channel, the first all digital Russian, Russian TV net. I hope nobody jumps up and says, hey, no, we were the first. You were the first, right? We were. Okay. And uh, <laughs> claims to have an unbiased portrait of Russia. We'll talk about that. Number three, Ruslan Tagev. He is uh, CEO of TNS, a polling agency. Uh, these pollsters have the finger on the pulse of Russia. He's the man to talk to about what do Russians think. We're going to find out about that. Uh, Irina Dorogan, general producer, chief producer, shall we say, of Red Media. That's uh, specialized in creation, uh, distribution through cable, satellite, TV, has 58 million viewers, 
cooperates with leading content providers like the BBC, NBC, Universal, Discovery, Sony. Shall I go on? Number five, Vlad Ryashin. Ryashin. Yeah. Okay. Russian or Russian. I'm learning. Okay. <laughs> Is he like? I speak five languages, but not Russian, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he is the founder and CEO of Star Media Group, producer of 100, and, no, I sat at 160, and you said that's an old figure. It's 200, right? You're getting close to 200 movies? I think close to And this. other programs, all kinds of programming. You also have 25, uh, Star Media has 2,500 hours of programming. And last but not least, Natalia Lakovleva, she is a partner in uh, PwC Russia, as you know, of course, is PricewaterhouseCoopers, and uh, they are the reality check people to do the uh, to assess and advise uh, companies of all kinds around the world. Highly respected company. So why don't we begin? We've decided we would begin. We got together and huddled, and we said, "Okay, who do we start with?" Because we would like to talk to everybody at the same time. But why don't we start with Anton to make his start with the presentation. Anton's going to be talking about how things work in broadcasting, the genre, the reach, the audience ratings, and more. First, we'll have a presentation, right? Yeah. Welcome to the video. Yeah. Roll the tape. CBC Media is a leading independent media company in Russia and the CIS. Within just five years, we grew from a private company operating two TV networks into a vertically integrated media holding company with five free-to-air channels in three countries. CBC Media is now the only public broadcaster in Russia and one of the most transparent companies in the country. We operate in one of the fastest growing advertising markets in the world and have a national TV ad market share of 19% with the highest power ratio among Russian broadcasters. Since 2008, we have also offered quality family entertainment television in Kazakhstan and Moldova. And now we are reaching out beyond free to air. To pay TV by launching the international version of CBC channel for Russian speaking audiences in the United States Israel and Germany. To the internet, by making thousands of hours of CBC Media's content library available online through our social television network, videomode.com, as well as being excited about the evolution and expansion of our services, we are equally proud of our track record in delivering strong operating and financial results. Within six years, our sales have quadrupled, reaching $600 million in 2010, as we continue to deliver exceptional margins by broadcasting industry standards in excess of 35%. Bingo! While we remain a growth company, we began paying cash dividends to our shareholders in 2010. Uh -huh. there we a sound track record but always strive for more. We have now established our internal advertising sales house which provides greater efficiency and direct control over the sales process. And we have transitioned our headquarters to a new award-winning office in Moscow consolidating six different previous locations. Coming together in a single team helps to build on our strengths and promote our core values. Innovation, creativity, responsibility, and enthusiasm. And trust. Together, we are a team, the CBC Media team, working with passion and aiming for success. How will we achieve it? We will either find a way or we will make one. Bon matin, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be the opening speaker for such a distinguished group of Russian media industry experts and also to be the first to launch the 
Russian theme at MIPCOM today. I was asked to speak about three topics, the uh, trends in the Russian TV advertising industry, the sh uh, forces shaping the competitive environment in the broadcasting space, and also to give you a brief look at the CTC media growth strategy. And we only have less than seven minutes left for all of that. So I'll focus on only the most important messages. And the key message is that Russian TV advertising market is already very, very large. It's last year it was number 10 globally and number five in Europe. The market has now fully recovered from a correction of 2009. And this year it is likely to post the record ever size in ruble terms and probably in dollar terms as well of about five and a half billion dollars. The other important message is despite being so large, Russian TV ad market continue to grow at a very high growth rate. Most of the industry experts agree that in the coming years, Russia is going to post about 15% annual growth rates for TV advertising uh, market, which exceeds significantly the average growth rate in the developed world and also in the developing world. If this forecast were to come true, Russia will become the largest TV advertising market in Europe already in 2013. And also it will become uh, the number five market um, globally within the next couple of years, just behind US, Japan, China and Brazil. What are the growth factors and the opinion such uh, optimistic forecast? Macro factors, industry, media industry structure and demographic factors. On the macro side, we know that Russia is posting high GDP growth numbers, consumption is increasing and also the share of advertising as percentage of GDP is growing. On the industry side, uh, Russia is dominated by large multinational consumer goods companies who need nationwide reach for their customers at an efficient uh, cost. And television with its high reach, high penetration, and its attractive pricing structure is uniquely positioned to offer that reach at an efficient cost. In Russia, television is cheaper than internet and any other media, and it's also one of the cheapest globally. For example, the cost of reaching 1,000 viewers uh, in Russia is about five times lower than in Germany. Demographic trends. Um, Russia, similar to many developed countries, is, has an uh, aging population, and also the pattern of viewership is evolving despite some uh, popular misconception that actu people actually watch less of TV, it's not true. The TV viewership has been fairly stable at about three and a half hours, but there are obviously divergent trends within uh, that um, pattern where 45 plus audience is watching more of television and the younger audiences distracted by internet, video gaming, etc., are watching less. Uh, these trends are likely to persist, which will probably result in actually growing uh, viewership, although the share of older uh, viewers will be increasing. Now let's move on to the forces shaping the environment in the broadcasting industry. The key theme is fragmentation. There's more options, more choice, which consumer, the viewer now has. And one of the key trends which has been evolving in Russia for the last 10 years is the increase uh, of uh, non-free-to-air cable satellite television. Approximately 20 or 30 channels are uh, being launched in Russia every year. There are now close to 300 non-free-to-air channels. And the number of non-free-to-air channels has actually doubled just in the last four years. This year, the viewership of non-free-to-air channels jumped significantly by almost 20% from 13.3 to about 15.4% in 6 to 54 audience. And we believe these forces will continue to influence um, the market. The next uh, source of fragmentation is obviously uh, viewing of uh, content over the internet. 
During the next four to five years, the broadband penetration is, uh, in Russia is expected to double. Also, um, the viewership of video content of the internet is expected to double as well. The opportunity here for broadcasters is to be present where the viewers want to see us and to proliferate non-linear viewership options. Um, the television advertising within internet-based video stream is increasing, actually at 100% rate at the moment, and we expect this pattern to continue. So what is going to all result into? On the left side, you see the, uh, the evolution of leading top five, top seven channels um, across the developed world. As you can see, as a group combined, the leading channels have been losing the audience share. In the US, in the last 10 years, the share of top four channels has actually halved from, 40, from 46 to about 24% of the audience. In many European territories, we've seen declines of 20 to 40%. This is a result of the forces of in fragmentation, increase of viewership of non-free-to-air channels, the competition within free-to-air space where second-tier channels as a group are gaining audience, and also competition from the new media. And we believe that Russia will be experiencing similar patterns in the structure of the broadcasting industry, with the leading channels declining, smaller second-tier free-to-air channels taking share, and a continuous increase of non-free-to-air channels and new ways of uh, consuming television in a new, new non-linear space. What's the response of a company like CTC Media to these challenges? Our long-term goals are to grow above the market. We, we, we also want to achieve it through diversification. We already have five channels in different territories with different growth patterns. We are increasing our presence in uh, content production. We are actively exploring opportunities in the uh, new media space, and we're committed to delivering high profitability of our business. Thank you. That's all I have for you today. Thank you, Anton. Before we go to our next guest, uh, Margarita, we're going to, uh, I'd like to alert you to the fact that we'd uh, like to make this a bit interactive. And if you're not already connected with the Estegel uh, web uh, uh, <clears throat> wireless LAN, uh, you can do that now. It's very easy. You just grab your, your ID card. You see the number on the top left corner, and that's your password. Your login is your name, your last name, and the password is that number on the top left corner. Because we'd like to do some interactive work uh, during Margarita's presentation. Margarita is going to be talking about uh, the, the media, the politics of media, about news coverage, about the openness uh, of uh, Russian uh, TV, RT as a content provider for international broadcasters. That's a very interesting aspect that um, I'm personally interested in hearing about. So, Margarita, uh, after the video presentation, you're welcome. Good morning. Thank you for the interest for you finding time to come here and to listen to all of us. Um, I'm the head of RT TV station, which is the first Russian English language and now also Arabic language and Spanish language news channel. Before we all started talking, you uh, had an opportunity to see our video about Russia, which I hoped you liked. I know that Chris liked because he found out that that's why he didn't bring his guitar here. Um, so that's basically what we do. We show the world what Russia is about, why Russia does what it does, and for how long will it, con it will continue to do so. Now, to follow our presentation, uh, if you would like to do that, you can uh, go uh, um, and type in an address, which is rtu.com slash ITV on any of your devices, if you have an iPhone or an iPad or Blackberry, whatever. And there you can, you can see it, and that way you don't have to look at that big plasma there. Um, anyway, if we may show right now, people who are there, if they can show our website. Good. This is the website of our main channel, English language channel. 
Uh, why did Russia need such a channel? Well, basically for the same reasons why the UK needs the BBC World, why the United States need Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, why Al Jazeera, uh, why Qatar needs Al Jazeera, not Al Jazeera needs Qatar, which, as uh, many put it, I mean the channel Al Jazeera put Qatar onto the world map. Russia needed a voice of its own. But that's not the only thing that we do, tell the world stories about Russia. We also show the alternative side of the stories, and we will continue to do so. And while doing so, we started to do that several years ago, we found out that a huge amount of audience is not always satisfied with the agenda and the amount of stories and uh, the political stance on some of the main world news stories. Just to uh, give you one example. For instance, when a NATO drone is being shot down in Libya, uh, the mainstream media lead with that story for the whole day and sometimes for several days. And we find that story very important. But we also find that it's very important that on the same day in the same Libya, 13 people were killed in a NATO bombing, including four children. And we will lead with that story. And we found out that there's a huge audience demand for these stories, too. So we'll continue to do so. Uh, to earn yet more and more viewers, several years ago, we also launched a channel in uh, Arabic, which is now broadcast all over in the Arab world. It also has a very different stance on the so-called Arab Spring. And the mere fact that it's different gains it big audience. Uh, the third channel to launch was one in Spanish, which is now broadcast in Latin America. This summer, we also launched a channel which is called RT.com, where we only show documentaries, which are more like the video that we had been showing before we all started talking. You can check those out. Um, but one of our main projects the one that I'm going to talk about right now, is freevideort.com. Um, in, in 2008, where, as you may remember, Russia was at war with one of its former regions, actually, with Georgia, which was obviously awful and unbelievable and still is to many of Russians and Georgians combined. But what we found out then was that lots of Russians, almost every Russian, was um, uh, completely, completely uh, disturbed and upset and sometimes even shocked by the coverage that the whole war and the whole story got in uh, mostly Western media. Uh, we felt that it was not fair, that it was biased, and so on and so forth. And after that, I mean, three years have passed. After that, I had several discussions with the bosses of um, uh, lots of... Uh, uh, international media, TV stations including. And some of them told me, you know what? We wanted to show the other side of the story. We wanted not only uh, to show how Georgians are suffering, but also how the Ossetians are suffering the other side of the conflict. But we didn't know how. We didn't have any pictures whatsoever. Uh, the major agencies were not providing them, or they had too little of them. And what do we do? We're sitting there in our Norway or our Greece, on our TV station, and we show that the whole, the rest of the world is showing. And that was when we decided that the Russian media probably are not open enough to the world. Russian media does have a reputation of not being the most open source of information, which I personally do not agree with. Uh, we do have state media that mainly shares the opinion of the state, but we have lots of commercial media that do not. We have media, including TV stations and radio stations, that proclaim themselves oppositional, and that would almost only show and give uh, air to people who um, have the views that are highly, highly contradictory to the view of the Russian authorities. Also, whenever something happens, uh, no matter whether TV stations decide to put that video on air or not, and even if the state TV stations decide that they better not, it is already 
on the internet, on YouTube, and all over the place, and dozens and dozens and dozens of popular Russian internet and TV platforms. So we decided that this um, openness that we feel we should bring to the world. And then we launched freevideort.com, which is the first Russian video agency. Um, all you need to do to use any video that has anything to do with Russia is go to that website, register, and download it. It's TV quality, it's free, uh, it's in several formats, it has scripts in several languages. We, right now we have close to 8,000 subscribers all over the world, which is TV stations and agencies all over the world from uh, more than 180 countries. And uh, you're welcome to become 8,000 first, 8,000 second, and so on and so forth, if you're not there already. We have huge plans for that service uh, next year and the year after next. Right now, what you can find there, um, well, apart from what Putin told Medvedev and what Medvedev told Putin, what they said to each other, is uh, lots of videos from the places where our correspondents are. Libya, Greece, protests on, uh, in uh, New York that we saw several days ago. We plan to have more and more and more of that so that not only Russian stories uh, become the, the main chunk of that service, but more or less all of the stories that can be interesting to any broadcaster anywhere in the world. We are a non-commercial organization, so we don't plan to earn money on that. What we want to do is to make our country and the world more open. So please go there and check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margarita. There are so many times as a journalist, a TV journalist, when you're very frustrated that you don't have the pictures to tell a story. Huh? When you don't have pictures to tell a story. So yeah, yeah. it's great to have that uh, ability to access pictures. Um, our third panelist, uh, Ruslan, is going to talk about being, being with a polling agency uh, which tends to map a country through its people. You can tell us about the trends from the viewpoint of the viewer uh, in the different sectors of the media market, focusing on TV and internet. Ruslan Tagiev. Morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. As you can imagine, it's quite difficult to talk after two sales of media companies. They have video and the nice pictures, and I only have figures. So it's the next seven minutes going to be quite boring and calm, because uh, I'm not going to show any pictures and no, no video. So I will ask to share with you some uh, data or some figures, which probably can be helpful for you to understand what's happening in Russia and what is uh, quite important for current media market. So. Yeah, it works. So first of all, um, the whole advertising budget for last year, as Anton said, it was a part of TV, but if you look on the whole market, it was $8.3 billion, which is a quite significant figure. And pay attention again that TV share in this, in this pie is more than 50%. And from our point of view, this share is going to be quite stable for the next year. So it's very difficult to say it's going to be on the level of 50 or 84 or 80, sorry, 48 or a little bit higher than 50, but it's certainly, we really believe it's going to be on this level. And the second media, which is the probably most interesting and most important for Russian market is internet, because of speed of growth and speed of, and a level of interest to advertisers to this media is really, really high. So from our point of view, if you think about Russian market, you should first of all concentrate on these two media. And perfect example, if you look on a share in advertising budgets, if you look on a share of electronic and non-electronic media for the last eight years, you will see that eight years ago, the share of electronic and non-electronic media was on a level 50-50. So half of the money came to print and outdoor, and half of the money all electronic media. Currently, this figure closed to 70%, and we are quite sure that this trend is quite stable. And, it's going, and electronic media in general going to grow next years. If we look on the coverage, first of all, let's look on TV. 
we can say that TV coverage is quite flat. So we see the small decline, but it's not really significant. It was 72% as average daily reach uh, two years ago, and now it's 69. The main competitor, in sense of feelings at least, internet penetration, for sure it's growing really fast. It was only around 40% a few years ago, and now around 60 but we can say that it's quite stable for the last year and internet penetration is from, by our expectation, not going to grow for the next year really fast. So we expect that internet penetration will grow by five, 10 percent next several years. Um, time spent on TV by different age groups. If you look on this picture, you will see how many minutes per day different age groups spent on watching TV. And you can see here that it's for sure that uh, older people spend more time watching TV and it's a quite stable, there is no decline at all. We can see quite significant decline for group from four years old to 17, it was 180 minutes or close 180 minutes um, four years ago and now it's 150 minutes a day, which is a significantly low. But if we come, ah, it's, sorry, before, before we go to comparison in time spent with internet and TV, I can show you the favorite picture. It's the favorite picture for all internet companies. So when they present the companies, they usually show this picture because it's showing different uh, reach for different age groups for TV and internet. And we can see here what group from 12 to 24 is uh, internet reach in this group is higher than for TV. But if we compare time spent again for these groups, we will see that uh, for group, even for age 20 to, to 12 to 24, amount of time spent on TV is significantly higher than on internet. And for sure, the amount of time which people spend on TV for uh, older people is uh, uncomparably high. And probably the last picture, which is uh, showing quite interesting situation is, and is showing uh, it's illustration what Anton said about fragmentation. You can see here the multi-channel multi landscape, the total share of a niche and cable, cable channels. For year 2008, and for, for year 2010, it was 8% in, you know, for whole population. But if we look on different age groups, we will see that for group 4.17, the share already 14%. And for last three years, the number of channels in Russia was growing, in this group, was growing by 60%, and the amount of households which have the opportunity to watch different channels was growing by 55%, which is it's really, really fast, and this, this trend is really important for all TV channels in Russia. So it's probably my final figure. So as a result, we still believe that market is growing, and by our expectation, this $8 billion can grow by 10, 15% next several years. And as I said, we really believe that TV is going to play the major role on the Russian advertising market. Thank you. It was even faster. Very interesting to, see, to watch that demographic uh, shift and the demographic t uh, tastes among, among Russians. Uh, let's now go to uh, Irina who is going to speak about that. She's going to talk about the nuts and bolts of, of pay TV, of uh, satellite and cable, IPTV, uh, the numbers of subscribers, the types of packages. On to you, Irina. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to say a few words about our company so you could get the idea who we are and what we do in the area of pay TV in Russia. Red Media Group was uh, it's, uh, one of the largest television companies producing and distributing television channels. Uh, we were founded in 2005, and now we have 13 thematic, thematical channels almost for all kinds of interests. Uh, annually, we produce around 3,000 hours of content. Our content library is about 9,000 hours. We cooperate with 1,000 cable operators throughout Russia and other countries. And we broadcast to 600 cities in 18 countries. We also provide the technical service for such well-known television brands as Sci-Fi Universal, Sony Entertainment, TG, Guli, and many others. Okay, let's move to the history of pay TV in Russia. 
It's been around for about 20 years. In 1991, the first commercial cable operator went on air in Moscow called Cosmos TV. Five years later came NTV Plus, the first satellite broadcasting operator. In the second half of the 90s, uh, the market uh, entered the regional companies. The first major cable TV operator was United Cable Networks. In the following years, the market kept growing steadily and it skyrocketed in the mid-2000s. During that period of time, every year, about 40 TV channels, thematical channels, appeared and the number of people receiving at least one specialized channel jumped from 34 to, oh, I'm slow, to 56. Okay, and during that time, uh, red media emerged, and within the short period of time, we managed to become one of the three largest manufacturers in the country. Today, there are approximately 300 niche TV television channels in Russia, four satellite platforms, and around 900 cable operators. Speaking about satellite and cable networks, I must say that uh, the cable television remains the leader of pay TV branch with almost 60% of all customers. And the main players here are Rostelecom, MTS, and Akado. Second place is occupied by satellite television, 35%. And the dominant players here are Tricolor TV, NTV Plus, and Orion Express. IPTV platforms in Russia holds around 5% so far. Okay, a few words about the genres of pay TV. According to TNS, all thematical channels in Russia are divided into 10 genres. By the way, our 13 channels cover 8 out of 10 genres. Based on the average monthly audience coverage in July and August of 2011, Four genres are leading, leading educational, movie series, children's, and entertainment. Based on average daily viewing time, the entertainment genre is leading with 40 minutes a day, children's the second, and the movies in the third place. Okay, a few words about our audience. The share of niche television in Russia is about from 8 to 10 percent out of the whole national uh, television audience. It's generally thought that the male audience watch more actively the niche TV, but it's not always true because in Russian television, in Russian population, sorry, uh, there are more women than men and they spend more time watching TV. So the kind of viewers for thematical channels is quite different and depends on the genre. For instance, our mm, viewers of our channel, Outer Plus or Fighter TV, attract more men than women. But for our Kitchen TV or Boulevard TV, the channel about the celebrity life attracts more, more women. Well, uh, but despite the numbers, I have to say that the, more important, the most important thing about our audience is a very high level of loyalty. Uh, a few words about production. Okay, when choosing production, production content for a niche TV, we always have to decide how much we produce and how much we buy. At average, it's about 70% of buying contact and, uh, content and 30% of uh, production. Uh, but it works differently for every channel. Uh, on one hand, it's easier and uh, simpler to buy the programs because non-pay non uh, TV channels, uh, they buy non-exclusive rights for a couple of years and it costs less than in-house in, in, in production. Um, but every channel has to have its face, has to have the identity, and it can be only achieved through the production. But here, speaking about production, we face a new problem, the lack of money. We don't have enough money for production. And the main reason for it is that the main cash flows are focused on the terrestrial television because the advertisers go there 
and they don't want to come to our TV. The main reason for it is that the media measurement system in Russia of, of, pay, t or pay, of pay TV is quite new and it doesn't give the detailed information of the viewing and it's not quite perfect. So uh, the money is there and we have some problems. Uh, well, and um, at the end, I would like to say that the rapid growth of the pay TV in Russia is slowing down, and we are now moving to a new challenge, the competition for quality. So we have to put more money for in, in improvement in the programs, in uh, development, and uh, we are waiting for the advertising budgets to come over because they will get the precise heat in the targeted audience and we'll get another source of income. We'll see what will happen in the next future. Thank you. Very interesting and frank uh, portrayal of how things are and how uh, the industry has to adapt to, to changing tastes and, uh, and, and ways of watching. Let's go on to Vlad, who uh, will uh, talk to us as, as CEO of Star Media. He's a, he's a good guy to talk to about uh, content. About the, we did uh, touch a bit uh, with, with, with you, Irina, on the breakdown between, uh, between uh, uh, bought content and produced content. But you can, I guess, go a bit more into that, Vlad. He's going to talk about the split between foreign and homegrown production on uh, acquisitions, on trends, what viewers want. He's a good guy to talk to about that. Vlad. So, uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, today I'm honored to represent uh, the Russian production market, its current state, conditions, and prospects. So, we would like to start uh, from the structure of TV content genres uh, that were on the air last year. As you see, the most popular genre in programming is TV series. Combined with uh, TV movies and feature films, this represents 41% of the schedules. And entertainment and talk shows represent a further 17%, a total 58%. All other programming genres, except for commercial and on-air promotion, count for 30%. 30%. 30%. Uh, you can see the proportion of uh, local content, uh, which includes series, sitcoms, TV movies, and feature films, and foreign content and programming of the top 15 Russian TV channels. The main trend of the last five years is the increase of local content in shadows of top 15 Russian TV channels, except, of course, for the crisis period in 2008. And 2011 will be 73%. And in prime time, more than 90%. The gross volume of commercial hours produced locally after 2008 is 27%, consisting of 3,525 hours this year. Uh, the slide shows the TV advertising revenue between 2006 and 2011, uh, and of course we, we uh, take uh, the figures of 2011 uh, of the first half of the year, so I believe that, uh, uh, I believe Ant uh, Anton, uh, that he has now more fresh uh, figures of this year, so we hope that, that they will be more higher, it's not bad for us, uh, uh, but um, um, you can see the difference. Um, in the content costs of the second and the third columns. The second one represents the cost of all programming across the board. And the third column represents cost of all local production, excluding news, sports, commercials, and foreign product. And uh, approximately the uh, production uh, costs uh, of the local content will be 2.6 uh, billion this year. There are more than 200 production companies in Russia, and the top 20 of them uh, produce approximately 60% of all local uh, series, sitcoms, TV movies. Of course, uh, every channel uh, has his own schedule. Uh, this is the general example uh, and trends uh, of the schedules and types of programming. 
from Monday to Tuesday, the schedules are structured on a horizontal uh, basis with one, two, even uh, three episodes of the same program every day. A vertical structure operates on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. As I said uh, before, primetime programming of the main Russian TV channels consists of more than 90% of local product. You, can find, uh, you can't find there, for example, Latin American telenovelas, but sometimes post-prime can have the best international TV hits in it, like Lost, uh, Mad Men, House, etc. Also, the best international feature films are in prime time, but their number is not so many. And the most popular product are TV series, TV movies, feature films, and uh, entertainment shows. Uh, so the channels need huge number hours of this uh, product. <clears throat> the distribution of the Russian uh, content in CIS country, of course, being close in culture and in language, we naturally sell huge volumes of our programming in many of the former Soviet Union countries, and you can see the our example, Star Media's group's example. So we have uh, in library more than 2,000 hours and uh, we sell uh, close to 100% in Belarus and Ukraine and a uh, little smaller in Kazakhstan and uh, one third part of our library in Baltic countries. Uh, at the same time, local markets in the rest of CIS uh, are also actively developing. In this case, Russian companies can use another two different models. One of them is pre-sale or co-production. The other, which is more strategic, uh, is the opening of offices in other CIS countries. For example, Star Media has offices and production companies in Kyiv, Ukraine, as well as Moscow. And recently we have opened an office in Kazakhstan and uh, are about to open an office in Belarus. These local operations are geared up to producing content for local consumption, but also much of this local programming has sales potential in Russia and other CIS countries. International sales of Russian content, uh, we also uh, can show our Star Media Group's example. We have already made significant inroads in the international marketplace. Obviously, Eastern Europe is an important territory for us, and we have made a lot of sales in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Serbia, and so on. In addition, we seem to have innovated Israel. More than that, we have also achieved good results in Scandinavia, China, Middle East uh, and uh, Japan. Uh, as Russia actively advanced uh, in the CIS markets, it also remains a very attractive market for big international players. Such measures as Sony Universal and the Mall Zodiac Disney have launched their offices or purchased Russian companies in recent years. And summary. The current Russian market shows one of the fastest growing in the world, which no doubt makes it attractive for major international producers of TV content. The number of localization grows along with uh, local content. Big Russian production companies are regional majors for neighboring territories these days, with the top 20 producing approximately 60% of local content in Russia. The top 24 commercial production companies are members of the Russian Association of Television and Cinema Producers, which has established and fostered standards and principles of civilized business and cooperation in the Russian market. State-of-the-art studios, technical equipment, and highly skilled personnel all contribute to top quality and cost-effective production. Today, a sizable number of Russian companies have established a significant reputation in the international marketplace. Star Media is one of them. Thank you for your attention and welcome to Russia. Thank you very much, Vlad. And before we open this up to questions from the audience, uh, we have one more presentation from Natalia, who's going to give us maybe a bit of a reality check, uh, also taking a look at uh, the number crunching of the media market in terms of investments, trends, and outlook in a global context. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure, yet a challenge to conclude such a wonderful panel of experts. So uh, nevertheless, uh, even though by now, hopefully, everyone at least is broadly aware of what the Russian media market is, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to show you how Russia is compared to the global trends. This is based actually on our global entertainment and media outlook. 
in which Russia participates for the fourth year in a row. Some of the numbers you would see might be more prudent than from the previous speakers. Uh, well, well, that's our destiny. I guess we are supposed to be more prudent than others. So here you can clearly see that Russia demonstrates approximately 12% cumulative average growth rate over the next five years, which is compared to 5.7% of the global ones. By 1215, <clears throat> Russia would become the fifth largest market in EMEA after Germany, UK, France, and Italy. Next slide only reiterates the previous message. You would see here that each subsector of the Russian entertainment and media market demonstrates twice as high growth rates as the world ones. Over the next five years, Russian market would double in size and would reach $35.7 billion in absolute terms. Structurally, two most important sectors would be still TV, free-to-air TV, and we believe internet. Well, previous speakers has talked a lot about free-to-air TV and uh, the importance of uh, internet and digital new media. Probably it's only worth mentioning that, again, Russian TV advertising market would become number one in the MIR region already in 2012 and number five in the internet space. And now, instead of me talking to you about the recent trends on the Russian media market, we thought it would be a good idea to show you what really consumers think about the Russian most challenging dynamic digital new media market. So here we are. This video clips has been taken as part of our global consumer survey. Enjoy it. Общаюсь с друзьями из разных городов и стран. Также состою в группах моих любимых исполнителей. Смотрю видео, слушаю музыку, обмениваюсь мнениями, комментирую какие-то записи. Я переводчик, поэтому каждый день почти использую интернет для поиска объяснений каких-то реалий, поскольку перевод реалий – одна из сложностей перевода. Разумеется, в интернете не всем источникам он можно доверять, но, по крайней мере, всемирная паутина задает направление для дальнейших изысканий и мыслей. По интернету я также время от времени покупаю музыку, оригиналы дисков, иногда книги, но это гораздо реже. Я веду блог в интернете. Читаю блоги других людей. А информация, составляемая моими друзьями, помогает мне принять решение. Например, пойти ли на тот или иной фильм. Если я даже изначально собирался, мои друзья мне писали, что он не интересен, скорее всего, на него не пойду. Что бы меня могло подвигнуть на покупку чего-либо? Ну, наверное, что-то редкое, что я не мог бы найти в другом месте. Да, мне как бы не жалко было бы заплатить за такой контент. И если бы он был вот доступен, что я мог бы знать, где легко могу его найти, куда обратиться, и тут же его приобрести и легко оплатить. Благодаря различным музыкальным сервисам, позволяющим запоминать свои плейлисты прямо в интернете, я могу больше не скачивать музыку, потому что я почти всегда в интернете, и мне нет смысла загружать это. Это всегда есть. Доступы. Если меня просят ставить любимые радиостанции и какие-то любимые вещи, я не считаю, что это какая-то суперсекретная информация, я готова ее сообщать всегда, кому угодно, в любом количестве. Меня очень сильно напрягает, когда просят сообщить какую-то личную информацию обо мне, там, включая фамилию, место, место жительства, там, не дадут паспортные данные. На самом деле очень сложно представить свою жизнь сейчас без мобильного интернета, потому что 
ты понимаешь, что у тебя всегда есть доступ к различным ресурсам, ты всегда можешь проверить почту, всегда можно, если с друзьями встречаешься, посмотреть телефон, ресторан, заказать столик, проверить свой счет в банке, привести на карту деньги, всегда можно посмотреть маршрут, куда тебе нужно добраться. Очень много бывает различных вариантов. Okay, thank you. Actually, I, I hope that by now some of you at least would consider investigating further the opportunities of the Russian media market. We'll be delighted to help you to connect with it. Thanks. Now I'd like to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions that you'd like to pose to this uh, high-flying, high-ranking panel here? You've got your opportunity now. Are there any questions? Uh, we have mics to uh, pass to you. There we go. Uh, please identify yourself first for the audience. Yeah, it works. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Klimanov. I'm working for Wondmore. It's a Russian uh, internet uh, company that does internet content. And my question is for Ruslan. Uh, you were showing figures uh, that were saying basically that people spend more time watching TV than surfing the internet. But my question is, uh, do you do any research into the quality of the time. Uh, I mean, people can be in front of a TV for five hours or the TV set can be on for five hours, but uh, what kind of quality viewing is that uh, whilst when, when people are on the internet, they're usually actively involved every minute of it. So do you do any research that uh, can uh, prove that or not? Yeah, you're absolutely right. What, what, what I can say that the main trend, what we found for the last several years, that in fact people become more and more, let's say, multitasking. So when we just finished this uh, very interesting survey, which was for young population, for people who is uh, younger than 30 years old, and they said that for today they can, uh, let's say, browse on internet, uh, listen to the radio, and do some other, and listen to the music at the same time, and it's. Uh, it's a quite a big question for today when we calculate the total amount of money spent on different media. In fact, it should be much, much bigger than, let's say, uh, than earlier because the young population, first of all, do many things in one time. So, answering the question directly, it's a quite, uh, it's a quite a big field for future analysis because, for sure, people are not so much involved when they watch TV, but it's, uh, in any case, it's a streaming, uh, we can say media. If we talk about internet, it's uh, much more, uh, how to say, involved. But it's uh, involved usually in, a, in a real content. It's quite big interest what is the situation with the banners and all advertising. So it's an uh, area for a future research. Did I answer? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Lorenzo. I'm coming from Portugal, and we create uh, formats and uh, entertainment formats and also branded uh, entertainment formats. My question is for everyone, if there is any branded entertainment experience in Russia, and if this is growing, and if, if this is an opportunity for production companies. Thank you. Anybody would like to start first? Uh that, go ahead. Uh, there are many international brands, brand formats uh, are producing in Russia and uh, in other CS countries uh, also. Uh, to my mind, Ukraine now is the leader uh, in production of international formats uh, for the local market. And of course, there are many formats also developing by Russian uh, companies at all. And uh, uh, Today, as I know, will be the presentation of uh, the Red Square, Russian company in the Russian house, and they will present their own formats. Uh, tomorrow, Star Media will have uh, our own presentation and also uh, uh, present our formats, uh, which we propose for the international market. <coughs> and uh, many of them, I think, uh, have a good potential. For example, Go Dance, maybe you see the trailer in, in Russian house. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the both uh, so the formats uh, go in, in both directions. Uh, on the one hand, international 
uh, formats going into Russia, and on the other hand, uh, Russian companies now developing very uh, good quality formats. Any other questions? Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Matthias from Germany. My question goes to Margarita. Are there plans to start other uh, language services, for instance, in German or Chinese or Turkish? I personally think that Chinese language service is long overdue. <laughs> Since we all know who's going to lead the world tomorrow, <laughs> I think there's little doubt about that. But uh, unfortunately, no. So far, no plans like that, at least as far as I know that. I've had conversations on that with uh, some of the leaders of the country on whom it depends whether to allocate money for that or not. And I was told that within the next couple of years, that's it, only three languages. But I will lobby German, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Another question. Anyone else? Maybe I'll uh, pitch a couple. I think we've got a couple minutes left here. Uh, I've got one question for, for Anton, because uh, since you've been, you have your background in finance, um, how, will you, how will things be in the next few years? We know who's likely to win the presidency uh, next year. Uh, there has been critique, uh, for instance, from, um, uh, hang on one second here that, uh, for, for instance, from Sergei Alexashenko, former deputy central banker, who said that no one ties their hopes with him, uh, Mr. Putin, in significantly improving the investment climate. Well, how do you see that for the entertainment industry? Will things improve or stay the same? Well, I think we discussed today the fact that fundamentally we see in uh, great growth opportunities for Russian TV entertainment market has been confirmed by various speakers uh, and that in itself creates a huge opportunity. We believe there is a limited legislative um, restrictions or constraints for TV advertising market and in general we believe that as long as the macro story is there, as long as the interplay between various segments of media, TV and internet stays as it is and the demographic trends are intact, we will have the picture as we've been discussing today with mm -hmm. no major impediments. Okay. Uh, Vlad, what about, um, any other questions? No. Sorry? Okay, good. There's a lady there, no? No. Uh, myself, Hemanshu Dhanuka. We are an Indian film production and a syndication company. Uh, we do regional films. My question goes to the panel. Anyone can answer. Uh, we saw in the slides that 30% of the content in Russia comes from foreign. So are you also looking for dubbing content from India, which it can work on the television there? That's a good question. Anybody like to uh, answer that? Dubbing, dubbing Indian film for Russian uh, consumption? You know what? Uh, one of our 13 channels are India TV channels. So we are looking, we are buying the Indian contents, we are buying Indian movies and films. So welcome to India TV. Yeah, I can also chip, I can chip in here as well. One of our channels is um, a free to air channels targeting female demographic, which is the unique in a sense in Russia. It's called Damashni. For us, uh, Indian film programming is, uh, is a quite regular feature of our schedule, in particular the classic uh, Indian movies from the 60s and the 70s usually de deliver good results. No, nothing is as popular in Russia among the female population sure. as Indian movies, nothing. Sure. Because there is, a, uh, there is right. a personality called Mithun Chakravati, who was very famous in Russia, and he's from our side of the region. So I've seen many a time that. Plus, secondly, how is uh, shooting uh, in Russia, is it safer because you say there's lots of corruption there? Because we as a production house always wanted to go to Russia and shoot. <laughs> but somehow my team was very skeptical about it. I think lots of It's a valid question, <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, I think that it's, uh, of course, <coughs> uh, this is uh, <laughs> a very <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> question, obviously. Don't read The Economist magazine. Russia is safe. Uh, Welcome. So, Russia is safe. This is the first one. The second one, if you want to produce in Russia, so uh, you can go to one of the uh, biggest companies uh, who also are members, as I said, of the Association of TV and Cinema Producers. And all these companies uh, are absolutely legal and uh, they are working also with government, uh, uh, with different funds, uh, <coughs> with Ministry of Culture too. Uh, and we also <coughs> develop uh, some different things uh, which we <coughs> want to change uh, in law. So <coughs> for if you want to produce in Russia, there are no any problems and uh, uh, you can find uh, a real uh, and honor partners. Can you see, Vlad, uh, picking up on that, um, I've, I've read a bit about St. Petersburg. Uh, they, have this, they have now this sort of duty-free zone. They have a new airport. Um, they have uh, launched an anti-corruption drive, very high profile. Do you think that could become sort of a mecca, kind of a, a new ho a Hollywood of Russia? Uh, yes, of course, uh, you're right, and uh, I think that uh, uh, <coughs> many steps which now <coughs> uh, uh, government declared, uh, there are hope, uh, there, there are help also to uh, uh, to take also our, our not only television but a production uh, of uh, local production market to another step of uh, uh, evolution. And uh, so, by technically, and uh, of, uh, by uh, having, you know, people a very good uh, resource. So there are no uh, problems even now to produce a quality content. Uh, so I don't. I think I answer. You know. Okay, I think we could um, need to wrap this up now. We're down to forty-eight seconds. If I can fit in a couple of closing thoughts that I, I, I did when I was uh, doing some research on this. One from RT.com. There was an interview with Robert Abdulin, president of the World Organization of Creditors, who said that the level of risk in Russia is indeed very high. There is a widely shared opinion that the Russian economy is very risk prone, and so on. Uh, but he also says, that uh, in mind that there are other markets that are quite uh, challenging in terms of growth, the Russia's domestic market appears to be one of the most promising regions. Um, another thought that I had was quite interesting was the from the lawyer.com saying that there is a the perception of corruption in corporate ranks. Uh, there is a perception of corruption in the corporate ranks. Uh, uh, but at the end, it also says that uh, there is a great opportunity and that the West is turning eastward for new opportunities, especially in the energy and manufacturing sectors. And from what we've heard today, it seems to suggest in the entertainment business as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. And of course, I'm sure if you have any further questions to them directly, please feel free. Thank you. <laughs>